Turn to Nehemiah chapter 4, if you would. Nehemiah chapter 4, uh, we're going to continue the study that we did this morning. And I didn't want to do that. I've got some really neat things coming up. We've been go- supposed to be going through the book of Genesis on Sunday night. And I have got some really cool things to show you out of Genesis 16, Genesis 17, and so on. Some things that even God showed me last night that just tickled me to death. And I wanted to be able to get into those things uh, tonight, but it doesn't look like we're going to be able to. Uh, let's just deal with the subject at hand, and that is the issue of, you can call this spiritual warfare, you can call this, and it actually is, because you're what you're doing is that you're learning the way that the devil will try to defortify your house or defortify your life. So let's say John. John has uh, a couple of weaknesses in his life. And let me just say this. It doesn't always have to be weaknesses that John personally has. It could be a a friend that John has. It could be a family member that John has. Son, daughter, wife, brother, sister, mother, father, cousin. It could be anybody that the devil will use to get in close to you to defortify your life, to, to vex certain areas of your life to cause you to leave a a gap in the wall (coughs) excuse me that separates you from the evil of this world the salvation wall that god has built god will use those people or the devil will use those people to erode away, to vex that, to cause a breach to be put in there. And once the breach is there, then whatever the devil wants to send in to rule over you, it's easy for him to do it because he's got a hole that he can shove him right through and there he is. And I, I won't say there's nothing you can do about it then because there, there obviously is, but that is one of the ways it can be done. It doesn't just have to be John's own character weaknesses, John sins weaknesses, or anything like that. It doesn't have to be anything like that, although it could be. It could be the devil will use other people. The devil will use family members. The devil will use, will use neighbors. The devil will use um, things that you are involved in. Um, a man I know that used to be involved in the Masonic Lodge that was a stronghold in his life. And I could see that it was there. He didn't understand it. I prayed for him for several years. And God finally delivered him and removed that stronghold out of his life. So now it doesn't have an effect on his life any longer. God took it away. That And God can do that, and He will do that. That's what He wants to do. But in the course of doing that, there are some things He wants you to learn. There are some things He wants you to do. While you are being attacked by your enemies, and I'm going to show you the verse in a little bit, that's going to cause you to find strongholds to abide in. So that those enemies cannot reach you any longer. They can't get to you using that any longer. That tool that the devil had against you is gone. It's worthless. It won't work anymore. He finds it out. You know it won't work anymore. So it's like you can say, devil, come at me with that all you want to. Because that's not working anymore. Now, um, Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 7. There is so much in Nehemiah that I would like to get into tonight, but of course, for time's sake, we won't be able to. Ezra and Nehemiah are companion books. They deal with 
the Jews coming back from 70 years of Babylonian captivity. One book deals with the rebuilding of the temple, the house of God, and the problems that they incurred building the house of God because the devil didn't want it built. Here, we have an issue with rebuilding the wall around Jerusalem because walls are salvation. Walls on a defensed city will determine whether or not that city is going to be safe or not. As an extra precaution, uh, just in case somebody, you know, might figure out a way to get in my back door, I've got a little thing sitting there that's just waiting to chirp. And it slides, it wedges right underneath the door. And as soon as, let's, let's say somebody is able to jimmy the lock and up, open up that door. As soon as they open up that door, they're going to get the loudest tweeting that they've ever heard in their life. And this thing is loud and annoying, which will then wake the dogs up, which will then wake, hopefully, me up. And me and my buddy A.R. will go have a visit with them, whoever that is. So I just hope they don't crawl in my hot tub because I would hate to shoot them in my hot tub. Because then you have to clean all that out. I don't want to do that. Nehemiah chapter 4 verse 7. It came to pass that when Sanballat and Tobiah and the Arabians and the Ammonites and the Ashdodites. Let's count this. Sanballat, Tobiah, the Arabians, the Ammonites, and the Ashdodites. And what do we have? Five. Five is the number for death. Death is the enemy. Death is the last enemy that's destroyed, that is destroyed. Anything that we sin against God, the wages of sin is death. And so it's going to bring death to us. So you can look at it in that light. You can look at it in the light of Revelation chapter 9. The sounding of the fifth trumpet. When that trumpet sounds, a star falls from heaven. To him is given the key of the bottomless pit. And out comes these locusts with the tails of scorpions. And they torment men for five months. And for five months, people want to die. Death is going to be taken away from them. They will not be able to. And I think a lot of bad things are going to happen on that day. So we have these five uh, that had heard that the walls of Jerusalem were made up and that the breaches began to be stopped. In other words, the holes that the previous enemies made in the walls that allowed them to just go into the city however they wanted to, those breaches began to be stopped up. They began to repair them. They began to put stone and mortar in there so that once that was hardened, you couldn't get in there any longer. And it says, when they were very wroth, and verse 8, they conspired all of them together to come and to fight against Jerusalem and to hinder it. Jerusalem is this church. Jerusalem is the overall ministries of this church. Jerusalem is the entire church itself. The devil doesn't just hate Bethel Church. He hates every church that is still holding to the word of God. He hates every one of them. That's what Jerusalem represents. And so they don't have a problem forgetting about their differences, coming together and to conspire all of them together to come and fight against Jerusalem and to hinder it. If you want to believe in conspiracy theories, believe in the Bible ones. They're the ones, number one, that make the most sense. Number two, they are the ones that you know are right. They can never be wrong because God doesn't lie about this stuff. So, now, nevertheless, verse 9, we made our prayer unto God and set a watch against them day and night because of them. Two things they did. What'd they do? Prayed. Prayed. 
set a watch. They said, this is important enough to where we need to ask men to come to volunteer to stand wherever these breaches are, stand over them and guard them and make sure that when it came time for the workers, the masons, the bricklayers and all of those people to come to fix this breach, that we had enough armed men who were standing there ready with a sword in one hand, a spear in the other, to say, I dare anybody who approaches this breach while we're working on it to take two steps forward. Because if you do, we'll cut your head off. And they would have done it. They were serious about this. And folks, I'm telling you, you're going to have to get just as serious about it. Nothing else going on in your life is as important as surrounding your family with the protection of God's grace, repairing the breaches, standing guard over the bricklayers, and making sure that nothing slips in while they're working and while your family's at home sleeping. Devil, you may one day catch me off guard, but I guarantee you it won't be tonight. Amen? So nevertheless, verse 9, we made our prayer unto our God, set a watch against them day and night because of them. And Judah said, this, watch this. The strength of the bearers of burdens is decayed. In other words, the devil will wear you out to where you have no more strength at all to fight off your enemies and to build the protection necessary to keep it going. So let's say that there's, let's say there's a man in our church. I'm not currently aware of anyone. So I don't think I'm telling on anybody's life. But let's say there's a man in our church right now. And the devil perceives that this man's children are going to grow up and they're going to really serve God. The de I think the devil can sense that I think he can understand that I think he did it in the days of Moses I think he did it in the days of Christ with Herod I think he smells the Savior coming and he says I gotta do something about this okay when the devil perceives that out of your family he will devise ways of going after you emotionally the stress of being a, a parent the stress of being um, a father a worker a wife a worker the stress of being the children in these days who are learning right from mom and dad they're learning right from the church but there is a constant vexation from the kids their age to come and do what they're doing. It happened to me a lot growing up. Kids in my neighborhood always wanted me to get involved in some of the stuff they were doing. And in some cases I did. And I wish I'd never done that. So the devil starts working on you to wear your strength down. So let's say, let's say the guy in our church, the devil's going to use his kids. One of them's going to grow up to be a preacher. The devil knows it. Let's destroy this family before the kid ever even has a chance. The first thing they know they have to do is that they have got to work on the husband, the dad. Weaken him. Wear him down. 
in some cases, just wear him down emotionally. To where he can't keep his cool any longer. He can't be the stable rock of the family because he sees the house breaking apart. He sees the devil working in there and it's driving him nuts. And, he, and it just, he starts losing it. He, his character has changed. He's not the same guy that he used to be. He's been weakened by the vexation of the devil. The devil just kept going and going and going and going till the man had no strength any longer. Or let's say the devil introduced, introduced a woman. And at first the husband says, I don't want anything to do with that. That looks like trouble to me. I don't want anything to do with it. Well, the devil says, challenge on. And he is going to try to work in that situation to get that woman to just paw and paw and paw and paw after that man. It could work the other way around. A man working on a man's wife just constantly knocking, constantly pawing, trying to get them into sin, trying to get them into adultery, trying to get them into fornication. And so your strength wears down after a while. You don't have the strength to fight that off the way you used to. It's just not there anymore. Now your pride might say, I fought this off before, I'll fight it again. But remember with Jezebel, many strong men have been taken down by her. So they start working against the strength of the man and the strength of the bearers of the burdens is decayed. And then there's much rubbish. First time I tried to work, really work with Steve, Lisa's brother in this church after I baptized him. I tried to have Bible studies with him. I tried to go out and talk to him. He had a lot of rubbish. From his previous life. He still had a thing for the ladies. He still liked to drink his beer. He still liked to smoke his little dope every now and then. And he, part of him I could tell didn't want to get in trouble with that anymore. Because it was part of his probation. But the rest of him's like, I don't care. And at some point, because of the rubbish that was in his life, I realized there was nothing I could do, and I pulled back. I said, I can't, I can't really help him right now. I don't know what God's going to do, but I can't help him right now. And of course, you know the rest of the story. God eventually worked in his life. But you can have so much rubbish a room in your house where everything in the house goes. And then one day it's time to clean that room out. Now, if all you had to do was take it out the same way you put it in, which was one piece at a time, one day at a time, that's not too bad, is it? But you realize you got to get it out all at once. And there's too much there. And you look at it and say, I can't do this. The rubbish... Too much rubbish from our backgrounds. Too much rubbish from the way we used to live and the way we used to think. And when we look at that big pile of rubbish, we say automatically, this is impossible. It can't be done. And we give up. And so, verse right after that, he said, so that we were not able to build the wall. There's too much rubbish in the way. The strength of the bearers of burdens has gone away from them. We're going to lose. Then verse 11. And our adversary said, They shall not know, neither see, till we come in the midst among them and slay them. Who was Judas? Was he some nut that was just hanging around Jesus all the time and Jesus hated his guts and tried to run him off all the time and it just never worked? Who was he? It's one of the twelve. 
He was counted as one of them. He was a wolf dressed up as a, as a sheep from the very moment Jesus called him. And he knew he was. And so those kind of people will come in. They'll be looking for situations like this. And they will move in. And they'll say, these people are so out of it. They're so tired. There's so much rubbish here. We're going to send our people in. They'll never know who they are. I've often wondered. Over the years that I've been here. If it hasn't been. That the devil. Or even some organization has sent in someone into this church to see what's going on which they don't really need to do because it's not like we hide anything from when we have service so they can watch us all the time without sending somebody here but I've often wondered that if that's ever if that's ever happened Certainly, I believe the devil sent people over here to spy out our liberty. And to spy out what it is that we believe and try to destroy that. That I believe. Okay? But that's what Sanballat and Tobias are saying. They're saying, Till we, they shall not know, neither see, till we come in the midst among them and slay them. And caused the work to cease. And it came to pass that when the Jews which dwelt by them came, they said unto us ten times from all places whence ye shall return unto us, they will be unto you. Now here's what, you know me, that number ten's there for a reason, isn't it? What would it have to do with the law? Okay. So here's how it is. Here's how I see this. Ten times from all places when she will return unto us, they will be upon you. So let's say that with, with you, the, um, the issue to break the commandment that says, Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven images, that's not an issue. So it's easy for you to come to a church where they don't have a bunch of idols stood up and they don't pray to them. It's easy for you to come to a church like that and say, this is a good church. I like this church. We're not praying to idols here. But is there another commandment that the devil knows that is your weak spot? And he can get you with it just about every time. I have mine. My wife has hers. Our children have theirs. And all the devil has to do is bring it in on a silver platter and say, somebody sent you this. It's free of charge. And he's got you. And he knows it. That he can use any one of those Ten Commandments to completely break your will down and cause you to think there is no way I can live this life. It's just not going to happen. Now, Nehemiah chapter 6. Now it came to pass when Sembalad and Tobiah and Geshem the Arabian and the rest of our enemies heard that I had builded the wall and that there was no breach left therein. Hallelujah! They fixed all the holes, didn't they? Though at the time I had not set up the doors upon the gates, uh-oh! Because it doesn't matter if you fix all the breaches, if you forgot to shut the front door. Then Sanballat and Geshem sent unto me, saying, Come, let us meet together in some one of the villages on the plain of Ono. But they thought to do me mischief. 
Because only one more thing has to be done for this wall then to be sand ballot proof. And that is they got to put the door up. So in verse 12. And there's a lot of things that happen in here. You read it in verse 12. He said, lo, I perceived. Um, let's see, who are they talking to here? That really say, I perceived that God had not sent him. He comes saying, uh, we worship the same God. We're on your side. I don't know where you got the idea that we're trying to fight against you. We're on your side. And God put something in, I guess, um, whoever's spirit. And he stands against him and he says, Lo, I perceive that God had not sent him. But that he pronounced this prophecy against me. For Tobiah and Sanballat had hired him. And I promise you, there are hired people working against us. There are hired preachers working against us, which is why I don't invite very many preachers to this church. Not less I know and trust them. Do they come? I knew Brother Doyle Williamson. I've known him. I know his testimony. I know what he believes about the King James Bible. He came to heard me, hear, heard me, hear me when I went down to Ron's church in Fredericktown. So I, and I know he enjoyed that. So he gets to preach at my church again. I may call him and see if he's available while we're going to be in, in Nevada. Because I'd, I'd like for him to preach here again. I like this preaching. But uh, where was I going with that? They will hire people against us. It's like the church that my friend in the ministry goes to. It's such a big church. And he worked for years as the head of their Christian school, the superintendent of their Christian school system. And I'm talking about it, it was huge, bigger than the local public school. And he said, Mike, I don't even know the names of the people who lead the songs up in the church service. He said, I don't know who they are. Other than I know that we hired them as a professional band to come in and play our music for us. And he said, as soon as they're done with their set, they pop out the back and you never see them again. Now, in my opinion, that band was hired not for that church, but against that church. Okay. And uh, Sanballat and Tobiah had hired him. Verse 13. Therefore was he hired that I should be afraid and do so and sin. And that they might have matter for an evil report. That they might reproach me. Don't be surprised any one of you. If the devil generates a false report about you, that's not true. Because it seems like in today's world, false reports about people are more often believed than true reports are. All it has to do is make some big news headline somewhere. Like... Um, local pastor Mike Hoggard found kept in, keeping slaves tied up in his church to do church work. Now, is that true? I made that up. Is that true? Is it anywhere close? It doesn't have to be. Because all they would do is release that story as if it were true. Never been investigated. And people would say, aha, I knew there was something wrong with that guy. That's all they would have to do. Um, Therefore was he hired that I should be afraid and do so in sin. And that they might have matter for an evil report. That they might reproach me. My God, think, that thou, think thou upon Tobiah and Sanballat 
according to these, according to their works, and on the prophetess Noadiah and the rest of the prophets that would have put me in fear. God let them hire false prophets, false teachers. A majority of the books at the local Christian bookstore are pure poison. A majority of those commentaries, a majority of those Bibles, a majority of that junk is nothing but pure poison. These men were hired to take away. I've, I've read uh, some works on the inner workings of the Christian publishing industry. And they don't look for men who are godly men who are leading the way with Scripture in building the kingdom of God. They're looking for the most way out there guy that they could find in order to sell a book that's controversial. One of them writes a book called Sex God. And he's referring to the God that we believe in as some God that thinks that the miracle act is some great holy practice that we should all be doing to worship God more. That's lasciviousness. That's what they've turned the grace of God into. That makes me mad. But he got his name out there with that. He sold a lot of books on that. And a lot of people fell for that stuff. Amos 9.11, God said, In that day will I raise up the tabernacle of David that is fallen and close up the breaches thereof, and I will raise up his ruins and I will build it as in the days of old. One of the things that I was going to do here, Todd, years ago, 1996, 97, was that I was convinced that I had to do this thing on my own, that I had to build a big church, I had to get a lot of people in the doors, I had to um, raise the attendance, I had to prove my merits, I had to work myself, or I wasn't good enough to be in the ministry. And I was, any new thing that came out, I chased it down. Because I'd heard it worked in other churches. And God took a rod to me and chastised me over that. And he said to me while I'm down at this altar, Mike, who do you think you are? Do you think that it really was you that brought 125 people in the service last Sunday for Easter? Because if you do think that, then I will put you out. I already have reasons to. I could put you out easily and I'll bring in somebody in this church that will actually listen to me and do what I said. Now, which do you want, Mike? Do you want a big church? Or do you want a right church? And God knew my heart. I had good preachers that taught me well. And my answer was to him, God, I know I need to have a right church. Not a big one. John Uter has told me that he's been here several times and every time he comes, he looks at that parking lot and he prays to God, God, fill up this parking lot for my brother Mike. And I've had to tell him, John, you wouldn't believe the number of cars that if God brought them all here on the same Sunday, we wouldn't have room for the parking lot. Because of what is God has done with the way God did it. I don't know that there's ever going to be 150 people filling this church on a Sunday morning. I may be wrong. I don't think that's ever going to happen. I think God is always going to use that online ministry until he comes or he's done using this church for that purpose 
and he moves us on to something else. That's how I believe it'll happen. So I have decided that I will let God build this church the way he used to do it in the days of old. Seek ye out the old paths and walk in them. And I'm quite content with that. And I'm actually happy with that because then I know God is the one who did it and not me. Now we can have, we've been having some pretty good Sundays here. We had a lot of people here. It just so happened that I scared them all off today saying I've been with somebody with COVID. So they're not coming. Judges 6, 2. And the hand of Midian prevailed against, and watch this. And this is the last verse. Why will God let your sin enemies? Let's say that you struggle with lust in the eyes. You see houses, cars, you see motorcycles, you see four-wheelers, you see boats, you see uh, fishing poles, you see jet skis, you see hunting stuff, you see all that stuff, and boy, you want it so bad, and you spend all your money on it, and that's really what gets you. And so the hand of Midian prevailed against Israel. God will actually let you fall into that trap. And go out and get all that stuff. Get yourself deeply in debt over it. To where you can't pay your bills anymore. And you're going to lose all that stuff anyway. God will let you do that. Look at this, what he said. The hand of Midian prevailed against Israel. And because of the Midianites... The children of Israel made them dens which are in the mountains and caves and strongholds. As long as the Midianites were at peace with Israel, the Israelites didn't bother with trying to protect themselves and their families and their land, their vineyards, what they had. When God allowed the Midianites to prevail against them and start stealing some of their property, stealing their grain, stealing their cattle, even stealing probably some of their children and taking them away to be slaves. What did it cause Israel to do? Israel said, we need to defend ourselves. And so what it caused Israel to do was go find some caves and some high places. This picture... I didn't spend too much time with it this morning. But the best fortress is a high tower. Why? The higher you are, the farther off you can see the enemy's coming. And what, are, what is our highest tower right now as a nation? What's the highest viewing spot that we have as a nation to view our enemies? Satellites. Doesn't get any higher than that. Okay, it was the U-2 spy plane. But I think Oswald turned us in to the KGB on that one. There's evidence to say that they captured Gary Powers based upon what they got from Oswald. Oswald knew about it. But they were flying the um, U-2 spy plane 70,000 feet above Russia and the Russians didn't even know that we had a plane up there because they're going there's no way they fly 70,000 feet and all of a sudden they figured out we've got a plane flying 70,000 feet taking pictures of everything they got up there and they finally shot one down but anyway a high tower is the best place in the world to set up a stronghold against your enemies so that you can see what's going on. Who's got the worst, as far as visual advantage, who's got the worst one? The devil. Because where is he? Always on the ground and never anyplace else. 
So because of the Midianites, the children of Israel made them dens which are in the mountains and caves and strongholds. And as long as they were up in the mountains in those caves, they could send out guards to watch on the mouths of those caves. And they could see, you can see stuff, you can see trees moving two, two five, ten miles away. And you can blow the trumpet and say, guys, we got them, here they come. And all you got to do is roll big rocks down on top of them and kill them, all right? But that's how that's done. That's why God will let the Midianites, your sin, some of your pride, your sinful nature, to work against you is to cause you to work on building a stronger stronghold in your life so that what they did to you the last time, they can't do to you again. They can't do it. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you, God, for this lesson. We thank you, Lord, for your word. We pray, dear God, that you would open our eyes to it. Help us to understand, Father, the way the devil works. Everything about him is in this book. And Father, I, I have yet to find out everything that he does. But every time, Lord, something takes place in my life, I want it to be a learning experience for me. Something that I learn so that I can then pass it on to these faithful people, Lord, who remember it, use it the next time that they are taken in by the devil. Bless your holy word tonight, we pray in Jesus' name and all of God's people said, Amen. God bless you tonight. Thank you for coming.